Hello, and thank you very much for joining me for today's ELDT lunchtime webinar on creating accessible learning resources. So what we'll do today is we'll go through um, the context of why creating learning uh, resources accessible to disabled students is important and uh, the various techniques that you can use through Microsoft programs, Blackboard VLE, and other types of learning resources you might want to be creating as well. So to begin with, um, we have a number of disabilities with students at York, uh, both staff and students in fact, and these can be very wide ranging. So how do we class a disability? Well, a disability is any long-standing illness or medical condition, and it could be categorized as mental health condition, a blind or visual impairment, deaf or hearing impairment, learning difficulties such as dyslexia, including ADHD, dyspraxia, mobility impairment, or Asperger's syndrome or another um, syndrome on the autistic spectrum. And each of these different disabilities requires slightly different approaches when creating learning resources. In fact, some of the approaches I'll show you today will, will benefit some students and actually be at disadvantage to other students. So there is no one golden bullet, um, one right approach, magic bullet to, to make all these things work. Yet there is a a need to have a combination of different approaches and trying to be as inclusive as you possibly can. Well, why do we need to be inclusive? Well, we need to make sure that no student is at a disadvantage because they have a disability or because they're a disabled student. The Equality Act 2010 emphasizes a legal obligation. Now this Equality Act builds upon previous legislation such as the Disability Discrimination Act, but there's a legal obligation as part of the Equality Act. But there are also technical approaches that we can use uh, to help us meet this legal obligation to ensure that um, resources that we create online are accessible to disabled users. The specific parts of the Equality Act emphasize that um, an educational institution must not discriminate against a student in the way it provides education for the student or how that student has access to, bene uh, or to a benefit facility or a service. So we're not just talking here about the course content, we're talking here about the way that content is delivered, even the interactions with, the, with each other, with other students, with the educator the structure and the, uh, the tools that are used, so the VLE itself and any emails or uh, that lead students into using some of our services um, that require students to use our services, we need to think about how those services are also accessible. Crucially though, we need to be making reasonable adjustments and normally this is a preemptive reasonable adjustment. So by designing in accessibility from the go, we can make sure that reasonable adjustments have been made and we don't have to then follow up later on. So reasonable adjustments means that we're, we're adopting accessible practice without incurring ridiculously over expensive costs. There is, there is a cost element attached to this and it might be the case that for some students in some circumstances, again not for all students, but for some students, the best reasonable adjustment we can provide is to um, support that student through provision of additional um, personal support or personal help rather than um, an equivalent um, online resource. That is okay as long as that's been designed in from the outset. So we have a responsibility and the responsibility lies with the institution but obviously as members of the institution we have a responsibility ourselves. I think it really comes down to not just um, wanting to make sure that we're, we're doing the best in, in terms we can but also remembering that every student has um, a right to the education that we provide. So what does accessible practice mean in reality? Well it all starts with whether a student has dis disclosed um, their disability to the institution and therefore we can make reasonable adjustments for that student based upon their disability and that will be a student support plan which outlines specific measures that um, a department or educator needs to address. But we also need to consider those students who have not disclosed their disability. So by designing an accessible practice throughout, we're, we're able to cater for that and be inclusive for those students who have not disclosed a disability and that might be for cultural reasons there might be other reasons why a student has not dis disclosed a disability accessible practice then also has benefits to all users so generally when you improve the accessibility of learning and teaching resources and learning activities you're improving the learning experience for all users it also means that you're complying with standards so it means that the resources that you create are interoperable with other platforms and allows you to uh, be a bit more creative, a bit more flexible because the resources you 
provide um, can be used by different devices as well. So not just on a desktop computer, but on mobile devices. So we can think about all these different considerations wrapped up in, in in terms of accessible practice, but it's just generally raising the game in terms of um, how we're using technology for learning and teaching. So what are these processes? Um, let's start off with a very simple document. Um, so the most basic of learning resource, that famed Word document. Most Word documents, um, you go to town with your styles, um, perhaps thinking about different colors and, and bolding things and font sizes and different color fonts and things like that, different styles of fonts. The one thing to get right, though, is the document structure. The document structure provides the framework for students to engage with the, with the, the content of the document. It also provides a mechanism for disabled users to navigate to parts of the document and, and actually find their way through, breaks the document up. Now you can do this by, um, you might normally do this by just putting some text in and changing the font and the color and making it stand out, but that's a visual element. That's, that's just there changing how it looks visually. If you use something like styles with document headings, you're then providing structure in the background of the document that taps in or accessible software can tap into to help students navigate through. It's particularly the case for long documents. So heading structures are really useful for this. And heading structures have different levels, with heading level one being the most important level. So you normally have that for titles of key sections, so introduction, um, summary, conclusion, uh, results, methods, things like that, if you're talking like article. Heading level two will be the next set of um, groupings down from that level one. And then heading level three will be, a, will be the subsections of heading level two. So you don't sort of say heading level one is the first heading, heading level two is the second heading in the document. It's more like a nested structure rather than a sequence. And so you use the heading styles option at the top of Word to do that. And that's present in pretty much all um, document creation software will have some form of heading styles um, that you can use. So don't use the font adjustment settings that are available at the top. That is just visual and that provides no structural information to the students um, using assistive technologies. If you do, do want to change the look and the style of the headings, you can do that. If you go to the little tiny, it's a tiny little icon at the bottom of the styles pane, but that will open up the styles box there, which will um, allow you to customize and modify headings so you can change the look and feel of your document by changing the heading styles. But that still maintains the heading structure and the document structure in the background. The same applies on VLE. So on the Blackboard VLE, there's a text editor. And if you don't see this full text editor, there's a little icon, which I failed to include on this slide, unfortunately, but there's a little text editor. Uh, on text editor, there's a little icon, which has two down arrows that expands all the tools in the toolbar. So any time you see this text editor on the Yorkshire VLE, you can select the heading option, and that will put in the heading structures behind the scenes. And you can tell that because when you're typing in your text in the box, normally it says as a path, as a P, and that stands for a paragraph. And that's the structure behind the scenes on that piece of text. When you switch into heading mode, when you select it, you'll see that the path changes to H4. So that in this case, it's heading level four, which is what the VLE uses as the equivalent for heading level one. It's a little quirk of the VLE to go with it. But you can see there whether something is then structured using proper headings, because when you click on it, you'll see the heading appear at the bottom, or you can see whether it's just been done with the bold and the font size, because it will just have the P tag instead. So if it's got a heading, that's great, because assistive technology will be able to latch onto those headings, and in particular, students who have visual impairments will use their assistive technology and jump to different parts of the web page and documents using the headings and they get a sense then of the overall structure and the key parts of that web page. If you can imagine the VLE, there are lots of components to the VLE. There's the navigation, there's the top menu at the top, there's the address bar, there's titles of the content, and then you actually get to the content itself. And all those aspects are difficult to navigate unless you can latch on to certain key parts. And those headings provide that mechanism for latching on. So 
use the heading styles within the VLE. Uh, don't use the, um, the font adjustment options. One of the other advantages within Word, and the same applies actually with Google Docs, is by using the heading structures, you can actually automatically create table of contents. And again, that's particularly useful for long documents where the table of contents will put in the page numbers. And again, this provides a nice overview of the document. So if you have a student who perhaps through their disability, the use of long wordy text documents is actually a barrier some dyslexic students will experience this. Having that structure and an outline of the document can actually be really useful. So document structure ensures separation of the visual aspects from the structural aspects. So separation of how it looks from the structure in the background that helps uh, assistive technologies latch on to key parts of the document. It provides quick navigation. It can break down large blocks of text, particularly for dyslexic users and enables non-linear representations based on those headings. So if you're a dyslexic user, you can break out all those headings, maybe on a mind map, gives them something that they can then form their ideas around based upon those heading labels. Images are also one of those key things that we use in a lot of different contexts, both in Word and in the VLE. Uh, we can use images for decoration, we can use images to provide examples, um, and then could you also use images to provide graphs and charts. So when you're adding images into Word documents, if that document is going to be made available, and um, in particular where you have visually impaired students, you will need to think about how a visually impaired student will engage with that image. Obviously they can't see the content of the image. So if there are aspects to it that's going to be important for their learning and I emphasize that this is where you need to balance the effort that you put in against um, the approaches that you you undertake if what is contained within that image is crucial to their learning and there'll be a disadvantage if they didn't see what's in that image then you have to provide some equivalent now a best way of doing this will just be to include it within the body text what's actually coming up with the image if that's not appropriate then you can also put in um, a title and a description within the alt text attribute when you go to the format picture settings for an image in Word. On the VLE, you are prompted to include an image description when you attach an image onto the VLE um, specifically for the purpose of screen reading software. So when screen reading software comes along, a piece, uh, along to a piece of uh, content which has an image in it, it will read out the text description because it can't detect what's in the image. So if your image has text written in it, this isn't stored as text, so screen reading software can't actually pick it up. In particular, um, this is valuable where you have titles, for example in headings, because again that allows um, the students to identify different parts of the web page. But if you've included graphs, you might need to identify different patterns in the graph. So there's a bit of a tension there when we think about the learning value of the image. We don't want to describe everything on the image. Maybe we need to encourage students to interpret the image in some way. Well, then how do we form the text description? And that could be down to um, describing the shape of the graph, just describing where it intersects the axes. Perhaps um, you're asking students to interpret the graph based on its shape, and that's where you put in the description. But if you're using the graph as an illustration of another key point, and you want students to identify to, to be really clear about that point in the graph demonstrates this example, then you'd have to describe what that actually looks like so that a student, if they were trying to explain it to someone else, would be able to explain it using that information. So image descriptions are essentially for visual impaired users, and that's that can be completely blind students. It can be those with partial sight. Some students also use screen magnifiers, so they can only see certain parts of the screen at any one time. And so the image descriptions help them to get a, a fuller sense of those images, particularly if they're large images. So in terms of text content, we can present text in different ways. I'm thinking here mainly of the VLE and web-based resources, but we can present text in different ways. And if we've got a block of text like this, this isn't how it normally appears, a, a large block, there are some problems with this. So the first thing we might, might need to think about 
is how that appears visually. And this is for supporting dyslexic users. First of all, left align everything. So we're not using this full justification. So you can see on this example here, full justification means the text goes all the way up to the edge of the box. And what this can do with certain types of text is create rivers of white space that appear throughout the text. And that can be difficult for dyslexic students to, um, to read because the spacing between the words varies. So by left aligning, the spacing is consistent throughout and it ends up with a jagged edge on the line. That allows the students to f follow the sentence as it passes down the lines as well. Include spaces between the paragraphs and include white space around the text so that there's what we call breathing room between the text and other structural elements like a border or a box. If you need to emphasize words, you might have blocks of italics or underlining in documents and word documents, but don't use these uh, in particular if the documents can be shared online. Underlining again for dyslexic students can be difficult to read because of the way that the shape of the words and the shape of the letters uh, has been altered in some way. So avoid blocks of italics. To avoid um, confusion with hyperlinks and web links, um, don't use underlining either because to me, if you've underlined something on a web document or underlined something on a website, that makes it look like a, a, a clickable link. And so uh, it can be distracting for, for students. Instead, use bold. Emphasize um, with bold without using underlying italics, but don't use all caps, all capital letters, because that, again, all, apart from it being um, what we sometimes say is shouting um, through digital text is also again changes the shape of the word um, makes it difficult to read for some students use the sans serif font so something like calibri or um, arial uh, they're okay something like times new roman or georgia has serifs which are the little tails and ticks on the on the letters and again they're not as clear as other forms of um, other forms of font So if you've got a block of text, how might else it be better presented? Um, one of the options is then to break down the text into s sequential bullet points, um, particularly if they're instructions or task instructions, use numerical bullet points here because that provides a, a sequential flow of the task itself. If it's unordered, um, for example, just a collection of items, you can use a standard bullet point to collect them together. It is useful, though, to indicate the number of items and steps in the introductory text, particularly if you're talking, talking here about assignment questions. One of the worst um, cases that I've come across is where a student didn't know how many items were in a list. It was a visually impaired student, had a screen reading software, didn't read the full document. It only read the first page. And there was only two assignment questions on the first page, and the remaining six assignment questions were on the last page. And because there was no introductory text that said there are eight assignment questions, the student only dealt with the first two. Obviously, a significant disadvantage there to that particular student. But verbal description as well might not be the most appropriate um, way of conveying text. Um, might be appropriate to create some sort of visual representation. And you can do these really easily, particularly with sequences using PowerPoint and smart art. Um, and this allows you to create diagrams very easily. Obviously, you have the constraint there that this is this will be useful to dyslexic students who perhaps would like to see things a bit more visually. And you would still need to provide an equivalent for the users who cannot see visually. So you might need to use a combination of the two approaches. You can collect together at the accessible alternatives in a different format. So you could say providing the, uh, the visual um, sequence as part of the main block of text and then providing a link out to um, a separate page or a separate document with the written version if it's a particularly long-winded um, process that you're trying to explain. That can be useful. So how might we integrate accessibility within a document? Well, if you've got tables and you have um, process figures like this, definitely use that surrounding text, those introduction texts, 
that, that provide that context. Why is that table there? What are you trying to provide in that table? What is this um, diagram actually showing? Because again, it allows the student to, to assess whether they a need to know, um, need to spend time focusing on the whole um, element here, the whole diagram, the whole table, or whether they can just drill down into particular parts. And B, also to um, be able to to contextualize that resource uh, again within the learning um, that's intended. So if you have a table, if you are um, a user who's using assistive software, you want to make sure you have proper headings on your table so that um, it's easy to identify where the data is going horizontally or vertically. You want a description, perhaps a summary and a caption, which we have missing on this example. For the visual elements, again, you'd have a, a reference to the figure and you'd reference figure one somewhere in the text as, um, so that there's links, clear links between these resources and the rest of the, of the body text. Something like a table, do you need the student to look at every single data point? If not, well, then direct them towards the aspects that are of most interest. So reference the images and tables in the main text, summarize if you can, integrated within the main text, identify the reason why that image or table or collection of data is there, but always consider the alternatives. Is there a better way of showing um, that information, particularly with very large data tables? So moving on to some different types of learning resources, um, Prezi is often used as an alternative to PowerPoint as a way of um, pulling together um, presentations where parts of the presentation are, are better explained visually. Now, again, this is really good for um, dyslexic students who can see then uh, the links between different parts of the content, um, different ideas presented in a visual way. But it's actually a very poor resource in terms of accessibility more generally. Uh, for a start, um, you need an internet connection to be able to access a Prezi properly. Um, whilst you can, as a content creator, download a PDF, that PDF isn't accessible. It's not um, a text-based PDF, it's an image-based PDF, and I'll, I'll touch upon that in a second. Um, but also, the, the navigation of the Prezi requires manual clicking onto uh, buttons. You can use the keyboard navigation, but if you've got a Prezi that requires the user to explore the different content, that requires uh, using the mouse and, and maybe zooming in and out manually, that's not something that's easy to do. If you've got a visual impairment, then again, it's very difficult to relate this different content to each other. So there is a, an approach that I'd recommend. If you are creating Prezi's, um, you can make a very quick accessible alternative. The first step for this is to scroll down um, when you're editing your Prezi, when you've created it, after you've published it, scroll down, you'll find a transcript. And this transcript takes all the text out of the Prezi and it puts it in a big long list. Unfortunately, the order of this doesn't always match uh, the order of the Prezi itself. Um, but hey, yeah, you can't ask for everything. So what I would do is take all this text and put it within a Word document. Then I would insert headings to provide the structure to the presentation. And then I provide that as a PDF. So when you are using Prezi, consider the motor impairments, whether a student can or can't use a mouse, how they interact with that particular Prezi. Make the resources that might be embedded, for example, you can put YouTubes within Prezi's, you can create a separate YouTube playlist, provide that as a separate link. Summarize the Prezi if it's, if it's appropriate. So if it's a Prezi that's supposed to be showing a particular process, then summarize that in text format. And also consider how the resource can be used offline i.e. as a PDF export. Now, if you are creating PDFs, um, particularly for scanning documents, be aware that when you scan documents or if you export a PDF in something like Prezi, it can sometimes be exported as an image-based PDF, and that is not accessible to screen reading um, software. So an image-based PDF, you can't select the text. It's really easy to check whether something's image-based or not. You just open up the PDF, get your cursor out, and drag across the text. And if it selects the text, then you know it's accessible. If it doesn't, if it selects the whole page, then you know it's an image-based PDF. There is a program we provide at the university called PDF Converter Enterprise, and you can convert image-based PDFs to accessible text-based PDFs. You simply go to Save As, a searchable PDF, 
and then you choose in the settings, you click on the settings button, you get this extra option to keep the original images and you only run this process over image only pages. What it will do then is it will do what's called optical character recognition. It tries to work out where on the image there are different characters in text format and it changes those characters into normal text characters and it puts a layer of text um, over the top of the image uh, that is useful for screen readers and then you can select the text. If it can't find or it can't make a, an ideal match it will put what's called a reject character in and that just flags up that the process wasn't very useful it didn't it didn't um, convert the character to proper text. So it can be useful if you if you're um, if you have a bad scan um, just like this example here it's a bit patch, patchy to convert it then select all the text, put it into Word, just see if that reads as it should do, as it should do, uh, should match the original document. So here I am um, with the example here where the text-based uh, layer is selectable. I've been able to select that with a mouse, but it's actually an original um, image scan. So to do that, go to PDF Converter Enterprise, which is available on campus computers, you go to Save As from the File menu. You choose the Save As type to be searchable PDFs. In the settings, just make sure it's got original images. Click OK and click Save, and that will then convert the scanned PDF to an accessible PDF. But it is worth just selecting all the text from the converted PDF and running that through um, Word, just pasting it into Word, just to see if the text came out OK. If you've got a really nice clean scan, it will work fine, but it's sometimes if you've got a second-hand photocopy or a scan, it can be difficult. If you are providing journal articles, it is worth approaching the library because they will source uh, an accessible version of most documents anyway, so it's worth going um, to them first rather than creating your own. Another caution, again, converting uh, inaccessible PDFs to accessible PDFs. Um, if you've got a PowerPoint that you want to make available to students, um, it's useful to provide the a raw PowerPoint file because that allows the student to print out the document how they see fit and they can then manipulate the, the PowerPoint um, so they can convert it into a format that's accessible to them. But if you're also providing a PDF version, um, don't provide either of these layouts. Um, the, the layout that we commonly see is this three slide and three note spaces. Um, that's really difficult for students to to actually look at the slides and identify the slides clearly, particularly when there's a lot of detail on them. So you're better off providing a full uh, slide layout option. So one slide takes up the entire page as a PDF, and then the students can print that off and again resize as they see fit. Don't use the notes uh, printout and PDF view because unfortunately, Although you get the text appears below the notes field and the PDF slides appears as text below, the image uh, above it is, is saved as an image. It's not the not an accessible slide. So an accessible slide would be one that you can select the text on. But in this layout, this is converted to an image, not accessible, not readable by screen reading software, um, although the notes text is. So always recommend using the full slider layout if you're having to save from PowerPoint to a PDF. Some final tips then on sort of uh, if you're writing instructions, uh, there's a big problem here if you're only using visual cues. So if we had the instruction for this example, click the green one, well for a start, uh, that's going to be very difficult for uh, visually impaired users. It's also going to be very difficult potentially for colorblind users. Now colorblindness doesn't always um, render the same for different colors. Uh, it can vary from individual to individual, but normally what happen in this particular case for a green, red colorblind user, um, these would both be shades of gray there are also uh, blue yellow color blind users as well so you've got to be careful about the color choice and i would never use color alone as a visual identifier instead put some text in there makes it easy for color blind users but also it makes it um, accessible for screen reading users they can um, if this text had an alternative equivalent if it was saved as an image start and stop uh, or the title of the uh, the link was start and stop that makes it easy for screen reading users to use as well Another problem, 
different color combinations. Um, here we have dark text on a dark background. And uh, we have here, obviously this can be very difficult to read if uh, you need higher contrast. So some visually impaired users will need very high contrast, but too high contrast can actually be difficult for dyslexic users. So again, there's a fine balance between the two and the best thing to do is to make it as neutral as possible. In this case, um, it's a real good test if you printed something out in black and white, how that actually shows up on your black and white printer. I think if we printed this out in black and white, it'd be very difficult to read this black text on the dark background. And that's a good cue, good way of working out whether something's um, going to be difficult to see on screen. So color contrast, print in black and white to check to make sure it comes out OK and avoid um, just being, uh, oh, one thing I didn't pick up on this one actually, avoid uh, exclusive directions. So here we've asked for um, further information available at the links on the top right of the page. Now, if those links don't have any good description to them, perhaps they just say click here, um, then it's going to be very difficult for a student, perhaps someone using a screen magnifier to identify, well, where are where is the top right of the page? Uh, where are the links that I need to click? So avoid just using um, directions that place those uh, interactions somewhere on the screen. So I mentioned there about uh, link text, uh, avoiding click here, because uh, screen reading software will just prov provide a link list. Uh, it can produce a, a list of all the links on a page. And if you're just using click here, it will go click here, click here, click here, click here. And the student won't know where click here actually goes without reading the entire document and getting the context from the surrounding text. So if a student's been directed to a particular page to download a report, you'd expect the link text to say report or, or something of that ilk. So in this case here, here's an example from click here to view my latest work on accessibility. I changed that to be a link that says my latest work on accessibility. Then I know if I click that link, I'm going to the work on accessibility. Multimedia certainly could be useful to present uh, learning content in different ways and appeals to different students, both in audio form and in video form. You can use narrated PowerPoint slides, excellent at conveying um, ideas uh, visually through animation, or we might just have a talking head. But then, of course, we have some accessibility considerations here. How do we um, adjust for perhaps deaf users or users who can't play back um, the audio because the environment doesn't suit it. Perhaps they're working in the field, they're only on their mobile, they don't have their headphones. How can they still engage with this type of resource? Well, on YouTube, if you're using YouTube, they have an excellent um, caption tool which you can add on. You go to the video manager for your channel. When, once you've uploaded a video, once it's been processed, you go to edit and then you choose subtitles and closed captions. And then you can add on your own closed captions. Now, if you've got a script, if you've written your learning resource with a script, you could just paste in the script and then it will match it automatically. Otherwise, you can type in the captions throughout the video. If you're using the university's replay system, again, you can go through the video and as you go through the video, just typing in the captions as you go. You can adjust the speed so you can slow the, the video playback down to half speed so that you're typing at the same speed that the video is playing back. That can be quite useful. And those captions will appear at the bottom of the screen. But captions aren't everything. Captions are incredibly time consuming. It might not be appropriate to do that for all the, the multimedia resources you're creating. So there are some alternatives. If you've got a script, if you've got a transcript, obviously you can provide that as an alternative. You can also provide a summary of the key points. If there are components of the video that um, are going to be crucial to the learning for a student to, meet, to ensure they can meet the learning objectives for a particular activity or a particular module, then provide a summary of those key points. Also, you might um, want to provide equivalent reading. So if a video is um, something that you found perhaps through um, one of the library's resources and that's not accessible, hopefully it should be, but if it's not, then what's the alternative? What is going to enable the student to meet the learning objectives if they cannot engage with that video? So always think about that intended learning in terms of what types of fact, how they're going to interpret the content and how they might need to apply that content to a particular situation and whether the resource that you're providing would enable a disabled student from that whole range of disabilities um, to engage with, with, the, with that resource. 
So to summarize then, um, accessibility is a legal and it's a moral issue. You know, we want to make sure that we are inclusive and we engage, um, have the ability to engage with everyone. Think about how a resource may be accessed, um, for example, without any keyboards, without a mouse, thinking of how text-to-speech might work in, in terms of the screen reading software, how students might be using screen magnifiers. You will need to make reasonable adjustments to enable all users to engage with your content. Um, it's your responsibility to make sure that the learning resources they provide are accessible. But through doing so, you'll probably find that the accessibility approaches will benefit many users. So further advice on this is contained within the York um, Technology Enhanced Learning Handbook, which you can search for, and accessibility considerations are embedded throughout the handbook, in particular looking at uh, the creation of resources in, in section three, but also in section four, where we're looking at designing activities. So it's things along the lines of, of quizzes, you can put time restrictions on quizzes, but again, that might be a disadvantage to students who are using screen reading software or dyslexic students a little bit longer in terms of reading text. So those considerations in more detail are within the handbook, uh, but that's an introduction for you uh, in terms of how you can create accessible learning resources.